so here we here we go i hope you can see everything and you can see me uh, the focus of the of the presentation will be health and satisfaction of occupants uh, occupants of the buildings uh, in general any occupants of any buildings even though our uh, most of our experience comes from uh, commercial real estate, be it the, primarily of the uh, office buildings, but we do have, uh, we do also work with some educational facilities, special care facilities, and, and, and so on. Um, but let's, let's get into it then. Um, so when we, when we, uh, when we build and operate and when we have and, and, and we use buildings quite often for uh, for our satisfaction and how we enjoy the premises quite often we focus on the visual things things we can see uh, to have things nicely designed nice materials and so on and uh, at least in our experience we have noticed that quite often the environment what surrounds us and we can't see always is often underestimated even though we breathe actually 15,000 liters a day, compared to the amount of coffee uh, you drink or how many times you play uh, table football at the office. So we think that it's, uh, the indoor environment quality is pretty, pretty important and uh, maybe, uh, maybe it's good to pay attention to it. Uh, why we should do that? Um, or maybe before why we can we can uh, it would be good to go through what is actually the indoor environment uh, which affects us right uh, so indoor environmental quality would be the of course temperature which we can easily experience and think of right relative humidity may be less tangible but uh, very uh, very influential on our thermal comfort how we feel indoors. Uh, Indoor air quality has a wide range of parameters, starting from uh, carbon dioxide, we have probably all heard about, uh, volatile organic compounds, which are chemicals, organic chemicals in the air, like type of formaldehyde, or can be also odors. Some of them are harmful, some of them are less harmful, so it's important to analyze them properly. Particulate matter, uh, quite often particles and pollution from outdoors in different sizes. Typically, we look at one to 10 micrometers. Uh, carbon monoxide and many other parameters. Then there is indoor environmental quality, other aspects like noise, acoustics, so what are the noise levels, what are the frequencies of the noise, uh, and then there are others which we can maybe see or perceive a little bit more. Uh, they are more tangible like lights or aesthetics and so on. And these uh, indoor environmental quality is important during all phases of the uh, of the building, so from the design over construction to renovation, and especially during the operations and maintenance, which I will uh, I will focus a little bit more on today. Um, so why does the indoor environment matter? Uh, I think that it's easy to to imagine that uh, temperature affects our comfort, right? Uh, but even more importantly, it has a significant effect on our health. Uh, so different types of uh, air quality affect, uh, affect our eyes and uh, chemicals in the air can cause some uh, dry eyes, itching reactions. Same with our breathing airways, it can have an impact. Uh, we can feel and experience headaches or it can impact also the way how we, how we think and are able to process information. Uh, so this is, a, this is a small infographics from International Labor Organization. Um, there is also effect on our productivity, which can be then linked again to, uh, to financials. This is a study of our friends from Harvard University, uh, Joe, Memo, and Piers, who did study on how uh, our productivity is impacted by different levels of air quality, uh, from conventional buildings over green to very green buildings. And uh, they, could, they, uh, they have studied how some of our uh, some types of our cognitive abilities can increase even by 60% in, uh, uh, in better environments. So that is very important. Uh, our satisfaction, so this is the amount of the service calls or the complaints we, uh, we trigger or issue when we don't feel comfortable in the, in the building. And it has impact both on the operations of the building and also the cost uh, how, uh, of, of the maintenance. Um, and, um, and of course, there is, a, there is a lot of data also that actually if you are a landlord, uh, 
whether you provide good environment and green buildings uh, that it impacts the rent you can uh, you can ask your tenants for so this is a study done by uh, by the University of Southern California and Maastricht University uh, you can see that there is a pretty decent uh, decent difference uh, so we can see that there is a, a lot of different motivators why we should uh, care about the indoor environmental quality in our in our buildings uh, depending, of course, what our angle is uh, as, a, as, a, as a occupant or a building operator or building owner or other stakeholders. Um, so what can be done about the indoor environmental quality? Because for many people, it's, uh, it's difficult to, or it's less tangible than many other things, right? If you have dysfunctional chair, it's very straightforward to exchange that while with the indoor environmental quality, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, so the easiest, what, uh, what uh, many do, is to follow the national or international guidelines. In some countries, uh, they are just guidelines, which is recommendation, which you can opt in to follow. Uh, in some countries, they are actually required by law and uh, you have to fall within specific parameters. All these parameters have been researched past, uh, past many decades. Uh, so uh, it's a well established, uh, established field. Uh, if you want to do a little bit more, uh, there is a voluntary certification, such as, uh, of course, starting with LEED, which has indoor environmental quality part based on ASHRAE, but you can also uh, utilize WELL, FeedWell, RESET, and other uh, certifications which focus a lot on the health, well-being of the, of the occupants and all the parameters impacting that. Um, and uh, typically, this certification is done, uh, can be done for uh, occupied spaces as well as newly built spaces. Um, and uh, combines best practices with some sort of measurements and evaluations and recertification every couple of years. Um, if you want to do uh, even, uh, even more and you want to know what is really happening all the time continuously uh, in your spaces, there is uh, more and more technologies, uh, technologies available. So you can actually follow the quality continuously. You can prevent issues when they are emerging and you can continuously improve the spaces for the, for the people and also see effects of your actions. Um, when, I, when I talk about technology, uh, and that's what I mentioned in the, in the headline, it's IoT, Internet of Things, which is commonly used to follow, uh, follow information from, uh, from our buildings. Um, and then artificial intelligence, which is one of the ways how to process and analyze data. Uh, so typically we see more and more uh, devices, which is Internet of Things would be the devices which you put into the buildings and they collect some sort of information and then they send it to the internet uh, where the information is gathered and processed. So quite often they use uh, wireless technologies like an ocean, Bluetooth, uh, and uh, typically there is a gateway or a couple of gateways which collect that. So example would be, uh, you can see devices which are used for occupancy, for energy, for equipment, for preventive maintenance. And those are different types of data streams. And uh, there are different software providers who can then analyze and process the data for you. Now, uh, when, we, when we look at the environmental sensing, uh, then there is a wide range of sensors uh, you can find on the, on the market. Uh, which can then follow the conditions 24-7 for you, uh, which is very then different what you can achieve with uh, typical manual, uh, manual checks uh, where you get very small snapshot of the, of the time. Uh, there is a lot of important aspects on the, on, the, on the infrastructure you are utilizing. One is scalability. So it's quite often it's very easy to put something across one floor, uh, but... Uh, then when you see the effort, what it requires, uh, try to imagine the scalability across more floors or actually, for instance, dozens of buildings uh, in your portfolio. Other one is reliability, both of the components used and also the infrastructure. Uh, so what is the data quality you are getting in terms of how often uh, data are received? Uh, accuracy which is uh, how reliable are the sensors in terms of readings and the data they are, uh, they are providing. Quite often nowadays you can find, or you can, you can find more and more of uh, certified equipment, which then guarantees that uh, the readings are within 
uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable quality. Uh, but another important part is data granularity. So do you get readings every 15 minutes or every five seconds, which uh, in the beginning might feel like there is not a big difference, but depending on what you really want to achieve with the data, there is a, there is a significant difference. And of course, security, which is yet another, another topic. Um, so let's assume that you have equipped uh, equipped building or your building is equipped with some sort of sensors already and they send uh, semi-regularly some sort of data. Uh, the question is, what do you do with it, right? Uh, and we have seen quite often that uh, companies would acquire sensors and would download the data and then want to see uh, something out of it, which becomes very difficult. Uh, and that's why it's important that there are experts in the field who can process the data and explain what is happening because this is an example from a, from a not so old building. Uh, and it's very difficult to see what the temperature, what is really happening. You can then compare it to higher granularity, uh, you can compare it to higher granularity of, uh, of data. And here you can see already patterns and you can see comparisons and benchmarks from different areas within, uh, this is the case of an open space. So you can see that it behaves differently and probably uh, if you come from the building background, uh, you can you can imagine what is really happening uh, already. Though going through this would take you maybe 30 seconds, maybe a few minutes to make some conclusion what you are really seeing in the data. And then if you imagine that actually you get uh, temperature, carbon monoxide, uh, volatile organ compounds, particle matter, noise, frequencies, and many other environmental aspects from many other many many spaces. So let's say five, ten different floors across many buildings. It becomes a billions and billions of data points which need to be processed, and it becomes very difficult for a human or even a team of humans to go through these data and make objectively uh, correct uh, conclusions. So what is artificial intelligence and do you really need it? Um, in a sense, you don't really need to bother with artificial intelligence and whether artificial intelligence is used in the software you want to uh, implement or not. It's just another way of analyzing data and it's the very similar, uh, very similar like asking colleagues if they processed, uh, processed the information on a calculator or on in Excel. In the end, we don't care necessarily and important is for us is the output. Of course, the, this, despite the AI is a little bit uh, hyped, I would say maybe uh, it's some sort of an indication that uh, the software should be able to deal with large volumes of data very efficiently and in an automated manner. So for you as a be it building user or building owner or building operator, for you what really matters, uh, what to look for is uh, are the outcomes easy to understand? Are they specific enough for me uh, to know what should I do? And are they actionable enough so I really know uh, what my next step should be, right? Um, so does, do I see on the, on the charts uh, waves and I need to still understand them? Or do I see some sort of conclusions? How do I rank across, uh, across my portfolio? Uh, how, how do I stand within the certification? Do I have material emissions? Uh, am I having some potential discomfort issues? Are there, uh, are there challenges which I should be preventing? Uh, can actually the software do some sort of forecasting? Does it, can it do forecasting for next 12 hours or seven days and do I actually need it? So those are more important uh, aspects in the end than whether artificial intelligence is used or uh, necessarily what kind of infrastructure uh, is applied. And as I mentioned, uh, we utilize IoT and AI quite, uh, we rely on these technologies quite quite a lot at 720 degrees. And how we see it is we utilize, so we collect really high granularity of the, of the sensor data uh, every few seconds about all the parameters. And then we apply, typically it's machine learning, but so, sometimes also some neural networks, how to uh, create layers of information and conclusions. So if you are looking at it, uh, at it 
or if you're looking for conclusions from very high level, you can see some sort of very high level scores, how the building performs, and you can compare them to each other. You can see different aspects or areas, how they perform and see what is the, what is the change. And if you are building operator or a facility manager, then you can go down and depending what, uh, what the details, level of details you need to see, we can guide you uh, to arrive to a conclusion whether you need to take an action or create an re easy report and so on. And thanks then if, uh, thanks through the tangible and actionable information, uh, you are able to do improvements, which then leads uh, to increasing health and satisfaction of the of the occupants. So you can see actually here is an example of a report based on the Finnish national guidelines. So you can see in this report how you performed uh, and how you performed in the previous quarter and where are the opportunities to uh, to improve. And if you want to improve through this, you can go then lower and see uh, what actions you should, uh, you should be taking. And a big part of the, a big part of the satisfaction levels is also related to uh, the perception among the occupants. So in our experience, the, uh, there is a big benefit, of course, from following the quality and understanding the quality of the indoor environments and taking actions when necessary. But what is even, I would say, more important uh, is communicating transparently the indoor environmental quality and the conditions people are working at, so to the occupants themselves, uh, so that they feel comfortable and they can trust that they are in a good hands and they are well taken care of, which quite often already increases the satisfaction of occupants on its own. So I hope uh, I hope I covered, it's a quite broad topic, but I hope I covered the, the, the basics. I wasn't sure how deep we should go in the topic today because uh, of the, uh, we didn't see who who has necessarily signed up for the for the event, but maybe we still have now ten or a little bit over ten minutes for Q and A's, and we can go back uh, to areas which you find interesting, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, any questions you have. And now I need to find out how do I find the Q and A's. So I see I see a question. Uh, let me read it for you. Who are you finding the main customer is for 720? Is it corporate occupiers, landlords, or a combination of both? Great question. Yes. Um, so we see uh, we see actually both. Uh, we see typically larger corporate occupiers. Uh, well, using using 720 as a solution, uh, we see also a lot of lot of landlords uh, finding out how uh, indoor environmental quality can be part of their uh, of their strategy and part of their uh, way how they operate and maintain buildings. Um, and uh, we see the use cases quite often across uh, across other types of the facilities, so not just uh, office spaces, but also uh, we have some public buildings, uh, schools, libraries, uh, special care homes, and, and, and a few others. Uh, we do see also some collaboration with property management firms who then uh, help either the co uh, corporate occupiers or the landlords to adopt the, and utilize the technology. Um, Yes, uh, I see other question. Do you work primarily with uh, facility managers, uh, building owners, HR, or which stakeholders are, re uh, or what stakeholders are leading? Uh, so in our case, it's typically the, uh, everything starts with the facility managers who have the most, real-time use case uh, of the conclusions and, and the actions they can take based on the, on the findings. Uh, and then the other stakeholders are definitely the, the building owners where it would be 
against someone related to the facilities. Uh, the HR is a little bit further from uh, from our field, and quite often uh, they they follow the process and they follow the results, but they are not typically they are not involved. Okay, are there more questions? No, we got another question. Great question, actually. Uh, if we see conflict between tenants and owners uh, when it comes to the data, and that's a, that's that, that's a very nice question, actually. Thank you. Um, this is what most of the people are afraid of uh, before starting, uh, be it the tenant or be it an owner. And in the end, quite often the answer is like, well, once we have data, there is clarity and we can agree on things and move forward. So we usually see that in the at the beginning, there are some sort of worries. Uh, and later on, people are extremely happy that it's not opinions anymore. Uh, and they can act actually on the data. They can see it's clear. And we have seen many cases where the corporate tenants were able then to uh, even order more uh, services from the building owners or improvements, which was good for the uh, for the building owners to to increase their uh, their rents. So, so initially we see a lot of fear, but uh, but in the end we have seen in most of the cases people being very happy with clarity. Um, other question is. Uh, do you agree that data helps landlords to take decision? Uh, I do agree. Thank you. Uh, regarding temperature, our big nightmare when you talk about satisfaction, uh, how do you gather the information from tenants, occupiers? How do you select persons? Because we all know that depending who you ask, the response can be different. Exactly, yes. And that's why we are not big fans of surveys. Uh, because if you if you ask everyone, everyone will have opinion, even if they didn't have the opinion, right? So uh, part of uh, part of our uh, infrastructure is that we use the digital signage in the customer building or tablet screens, where the uh, where the indoor environment quality is communicated to the tenants or occupants, and they can provide feedback, right? So you know that actually if the feedback comes, it's from a person who really cares, who is keen on providing the feedback, and it's less random than if you ask everyone across the building. Um, so we do not select the people, but the way how we enable people to provide feedback, they are selected because they are the ones who, uh, who have a reason or who have some sort of a need to communicate about the indoor environmental quality. Um, and other parties uh, which we have noticed is the psychosocial aspect of the indoor environmental quality. So if there is no data, no information, uh, quite often people tend to have their opinions and guesses. And uh, if you ask about opinions or guesses, uh, the data uh, or the information gets really distorted. So in the end, what we are doing is that we collect the subjective data uh, from the people who are keen on providing uh, uh, some sort of feedback, and then we match these with the objective data. So if somebody reports it's too cold or too hot, we can also match whether in that area it was too cold or too hot, or if it's, uh, if it's more at, at, uh, impacted by the some so, so psychosocial bias. Uh, another question, do you take human side opinions into consideration? Yes, so as I just mentioned, we collect the subjective data from, uh, from the people uh, and then we match it with the objective data so we can explain, right? And if you see that there is more on the objective data uh, to, be, uh, to be adjusted, then you do the adjustments. If you see that actually the people's perception differs a lot uh, from, uh, from the objective data, uh, quite often, uh, according to many studies, quite often uh, uh, there are effects like stress, uh, or deadlines and so on, which induce people to uh, 
to uh, subconsciously or unconsciously uh, complain about uh, environmental aspects. Um, another question, uh, that means the tablets are open to everyone in the building? Uh, exactly, exactly. So it's a, it's a screen like a tablet or digital signage where any occupant can anytime go check indoor environmental quality and if they still feel uh, that there is something which they don't like or they would have a different preference, uh, they can submit uh, information to the, to the facility manager or building operator. Perfect, thank you for your questions. I hope there is, uh, we still have a few minutes for a few more. I wasn't sure if I should be marking the questions as answered or, but that we will learn for the next time. Um, I also wanted to mention earlier that uh, please, I would appreciate your feedback on this session. This was our first time doing it online. Uh, and I wanted to share my contact information. I stopped with the screen sharing, so maybe I can put it uh, to the chat. Uh, that is my that is my email. So please feel free to reach out whether you have questions on the on the topic, uh, be it indoor environmental quality or technology or any data analysis part, as well as your feedback. I would appreciate to learn and next time we can that we can improve all right and if there are no more questions then i would like to thank you everyone for showing up thank you for your questions i hope that it was uh, it was useful and also thank you to the organizers and walter and everyone in the team uh, this was an interesting experience i'm looking forward to follow what is happening thank you so much thomas on behalf of global protect online for your keynote today we enjoyed really having you uh, on our uh, website today so thank you so much for hosting and uh, i wish everyone a, a nice ending of the year and uh, happy holidays